You know, a false teacher is someone who misrepresents the language of the epistles to overrule the language of Jesus in the Gospels. Do you want me to say that again? A false teacher is someone who misrepresents the language of the epistles in order to overrule the language of Jesus in the Gospels. I kind of think that Jesus takes precedence over Paul. And to believe the opposite of that is not to be Bible believing. I'm just saying. Jesus came saying, you have heard it said, but now I say. He came from heaven to teach us the mindset of heaven, the perceptions of heaven, the language of heaven. All he talked about was his Father who is in heaven. He taught us to pray from heaven to earth, and he opens up our whole personality to understand that now you are in this world, you are not of it, but now you belong to this other realm that I belong to. And we're going to teach you that language, that perception, because your destiny here on earth is to be a citizen of heaven here on earth and to interact with heaven and to have encounters and experiences with God from a greater dimension. So in Ephesians 2, 19 and 22, it talks about the fact that we are fellow citizens of heaven. And that means we are a native of the same place. It's the same root meaning, fellow citizen, as conversation, that our conversation is in heaven, Philippians 3.20. Our conversation, our very lifestyle is in heaven because heaven wants you to embrace something that's not of this world so that we can break the power that's holding this world And we break that power when we learn to live from heaven to earth. Jesus gave Peter, when Peter suddenly saw it, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, he's had a lens change, and Jesus piles right into that lens change and says, yeah, and your name is Peter, and upon this rock will be built this church, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And the keys of the kingdom are that we can bind on earth what has been bound in heaven. That means we need to know what heaven is binding and you can loose on earth what's been loosed in heaven so you need to know what's available in heaven because you're a citizen of heaven living here on earth that's your lens for life in the spirit we're fellow heirs we're heirs of God joint heirs with Jesus and we are partakers in Christ we have a heaven to earth spirituality And that's what's happening. That's the great awakening that's going on in this country, I believe. And for some people, it's going to be a rude awakening. For some people who say that we are a Bible-believing church, but their lifestyle doesn't actually evidence that, because all of our lifestyle is based around struggle, all of our pastoral ministry, most of it is rooted in cleansing up the old man, 15 ways to change this, 14 ways to do that. All we're doing is we're pastoring the old men. We're not pastoring the new. And you know what? That is a multi-billion dollar industry in this country. That's what we're up against. But you know what? Life in the spirit is about the one with the one. One person walking with God is always going to be in a majority. The word conversation means to live and behave as a citizen, to assume all the rights and benefits of citizenship, to live in accordance with our heavenly community. You are a citizen of heaven living here on earth. You're a new creation because Christ lives in you and you have the mind of Christ. That sets you up to see things the way that God sees them and to think about them the way that he would. So Colossians uh, 3, verse 1 says, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Why? Because you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Guys, you get it? That you need 
lens after lens after lens after lens to be changed. And that's what God is doing with us. He's messing with us. He's messing with our doctrine. He's messing with our theology. He's messing with our tradition. Because anything that doesn't line up with what Jesus actually did for us needs to be discarded. Anything that doesn't line up with heavenly purpose about you being made in the image of God as the prime purpose of God. Jesus didn't come that we might have meetings and have them more abundantly. He came that we could have life in all of its fullness that there is an abundance, there is a fullness, there is a favor that is positively outrageous. There is a, that God wants to lavish things on us. If you read the language of Ephesians chapter one, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. I have a way of thinking that takes you above your circumstances because I don't want you living below the line of your privilege. I want this life to take you above that line because the whole world is waiting for you to live an above the line spirituality. To have a mindset so brilliant, so amazing that it changes the culture and society all around you that wisdom can come into the earth. And finally, we can lay logic and reason and rationale in its rightful place. They're good, but they're not that good. Not when they come up against wisdom, which is the party animal of heaven. (laughs) Wisdom will get you rejoicing, will move you into a higher level of praise and worship more than any other thing. Because wisdom sees things the way God sees it. Wisdom understands the way God thinks, the way he sees, and the way he likes to do things. If we're going to interact with Jesus as a fellow heir and as citizens of heaven living here on earth, we need the same lens that he had. We've got to bind and loose on earth what has been given to us in heaven, so we need to be involved with the kingdom. There are so many areas of your life that God is longing to change your perception. Your circumstances are not the problem. Your perception of your circumstances is the problem. We need to become partakers of Jesus. Hebrews 3.1 says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling. Consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. That Jesus wants to give you a confession that's in line with the purpose of God for you. Hebrews 3.14 says, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. That means when you have a lens change, you hold on to it and you see things through it and you stop defaulting to a lower type of vision, but you allow that spiritual vision that God gives you through a lens change to govern your situation and your life now so that you go to another level of being in Christ. You go to a higher level of who he is in you. And 2 Peter 1.4 says, For by these he has granted us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. You are here for one person, one, one purpose only. That is to be made in the image of God. Every single situation, oppositional feature, difficult person, everything is designed to make you in the image of God. And when you understand that's the primary purpose of God and you get it and you see it, your whole thinking changes in line with it. We're going to talk about more about that this weekend. We've got so many things in common with Jesus. Let me read you this one in Matthew 22. This cracks me up. This is Jesus at his best day. Jesus had this ongoing dialogue with the Pharisees 
And because here's the thing, they have one lens from their tradition, from the law of Moses. He comes from heaven with a completely different lens. You have heard it said, but now I say. Five times in one sermon, he uses that same phrase in the Sermon on the Mount. So in Matthew 22, verse 34, we read this. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, <laughs> asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, uh, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Here's the thing. Why is that a test? Because the Pharisees believed that all commands were equal. And here's the thing. Therefore, they believed that all the commandments were the greatest, not just one or two. They had 613 commandments, most of which they had made up and put in there. And, they can, and so they, they, were, they were concerned that all their commandments were of equal importance. You know when someone is tracking with the letter of the law and not the spirit of it, because when something goes wrong, they invent a rule to make sure it can never happen again. And so you end up with all these infringements, create all these rules where everyone then is oppressed by those rules forevermore. And Jesus came to break the stranglehold of that law and he came to break that legalistic, pharisaical spirit. So the only correct answer to the Pharisees was, they are all commands for a reason, therefore they are all the greatest. And Jesus says this, he says that some commandments are more important than others. Some are primary, others are secondary. And he says that all the law and the prophets are to be interpreted through the two greatest commandments. What's he doing? He's saying you can reduce the whole of Scripture to two things and you'll still get all the revelation and blessing that God wants you to have. You can reduce everything to love the Lord your God with everything in you and then love your neighbor as you'd like to be loved yourself. And if you practice the royal law of love, the whole of the Bible will open up to you whether you know it or not. These are the two most important and all the others are to be understood in the light of those two. And so the implications of what Jesus is saying here are enormous. He's declaring that he has a lens by which he views Scripture. Dun, dun, dun. He has a lens by which he views Scripture. So at the very least here, Let's follow the example of the people in Berea in Acts 17. It says when, uh, when, when the guys landed, Acts 17 and verse 10. They sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they'd arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. And these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. For they received the word with great eagerness and they examined the scriptures daily to see whether those things were true. So they were looking for the truth. Pharisees examine the scripture to prove that they're right. That's legalism. A good Berean searches the scriptures to see is that word you're saying, is it the truth? Let's at least be good Bereans. At some point, you know, we're all going to have encounters with God that change everything. So Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, suddenly he's there with, you know, three of his guys and suddenly his whole face 
is changed and he is transfigured before them and they get to see his heavenly personality. What's happening? He wants them to have a lens change. And so then he gets Moses and Elijah to appear with him, you know, like you do. And what's he doing? Two of the most foremost prophets in the Old Testament are now here serving Jesus in the New Testament. And Jesus came saying to people, you've had all the law and the prophets until John, but now I'm here. What's he saying? Because I'm here, we're going to do prophecy and the prophetic entirely differently. You had the law and the prophets until John. In other words, no prophet can be legalistic in our culture because the law and the prophets were done away with in John. When John, he's the last of the Old Testament prophets, he comes and bows to Jesus, who's the first in a New Testament line of prophets, and he says, I and all that I represent in the prophetic must decrease, and you and all that you represent must increase. So the law must decrease, and grace must increase, because Jesus was full of grace and truth. Not full of truth and grace. So the whole prophetic undergoes a lens change. Wouldn't it be neat if some of our modern day prophets actually caught on and stopped prophesying judgment and started prophesying out of the richness of the presence of God and the grace of God and the goodness of God, because the Bible is very clear that we overcome evil with good. It's a lens change. Your lens allows you to see things from a different level, a different height. So here's the question, guys. Does your lens require cleaning? Does it need repairing? Or does it need replacing? What's the Lord saying to you about how you should be viewing things? What thoughts does God want to give you that can't land in your heart because your lens is where we only do it this way? We only see it this way. I know, Lord, you're trying to make a point with this sheet lowered from heaven and creepy crawlies, but seriously, we don't do this sort of stuff. It's not kosher. You wrote the book, remember? Peter, what I call clean, don't you call unclean. And a guy who has a lens that tells him it's okay to murder people in the name of God because I'm a theologian and I'm, you know, I'm in the strictest sect of the Pharisees and so I've got the seal of approval until he finds out that actually he doesn't and he's horror struck. He's horror struck by what he doesn't know. He's horror struck by what he has not encountered personally. God is coming to every single one of us who named the name of Jesus in America, and he's going to give us a lens change after lens change after lens change after lens change. Because we need to see the kingdom. We need to see the glory of God. We need to see the presence of God. We need to come into that place where we can have dynamic encounters that befit a habitational culture, which is what we are in. So guys, at the start of our weekend together, I'm telling you, when you leave here, you're going to have a whole new prescription for how you see things. So I want you to prepare yourself. I want you to prepare yourself. I don't want you to acquiesce to everything I'm saying. You're not a dummy. Don't act like one. But do take it to the Holy Spirit and say, you show me. Show me, Lord. I, want, I need to see. Open my eyes that I may see. I need to see it. I need to see who I can become. I need to see who you really are for me. 
May the eyes of your heart be enlightened, that you would see all that God wants to be for you and all that you get to be in Jesus' name by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. This is a great moment right here, right here, right now. This, for many of us here, Lord, is going to be the beginning of our reformation. Every bit of what was, of what, every bit of as important as what happened in the Protestant Reformation, every bit as important as what happened in the charismatic renewal when suddenly the Holy Spirit explodes into life in the earth. We are right on the cusp of a major reformation in this country. And it's going to come because our lens has changed. Because God has opened up our eyes and we're seeing things that we never saw before and we're thinking things that we never thought before. And it's a little perplexing, it's a tad bewildering and it's, it's definitely uncomfortable. You're gonna make us uncomfortable but you're quite happy about that because you gave us the comforter so that you could make us uncomfortable. So you could take us out of our comfort zone and put us in a place where we're a little nervous, but you can say, here's the comforter, just let him touch you and you'll be fine. So here we are, Lord, and we're saying, Change my lens so I can see something better, more clearly. I can see something that's more dynamic and powerful and life-changing and world-changing. Change my lens about Jesus and the Holy Spirit and me. Open my eyes, Lord, that I may see. And I ask it, Lord, for the name of and for the sake of the Lord Jesus. Because he deserves to be represented by a people who can see clearly everything that he came to do for us. So I ask it in his name. Amen. Thanks for listening, guys. I appreciate it.